Hey everyone, welcome to this week's release of the Hashrate Happy Hour podcast. On today's show, my guest is Bob Burnett. Bob is the CEO and founder of Barefoot Mining, a company that is focused on the development of the horse class Bitcoin mining site. Barefoot Mining has made it a goal to grow and expand the Bitcoin network via Bitcoin mining by expanding its footprint across a wide range of scales, site locations, and power sources. Barefoot Mining and Bob are in a unique position to shed light on some of the more unique, off-grid electrical sources of power. On today's show, Bob and I talk through his thoughts and opinions on the commoditization of Bitcoin mining servers, why the Bitcoin mining server industry has some insulation from becoming as commoditized as the personal computer and the cell phone industries. We explore some of the different attack vectors that Bitcoin mining needs to stay insulated from and what the horse class mining sites are and how barefoot mining is approaching off-grid power. Bob brings over 35 years of knowledge and experience in the technology industry to this conversation, and he has a wealth of knowledge on these unique off-grid power sources. This conversation is a phenomenal look into the world of alternative power sources. And with that, I hope that you enjoy today's show with Bob Burnett. Hey everyone, welcome back to the show. Like I said in the introduction, I'm here with Bob Burnett, the CEO and founder at Barefoot Mining. Bob, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me, Ben. Looking forward to the conversation today. Um, what I would really like to start with is your background. And you have such a, a fascinating background in the IT and computer world and industry. I, I'd love if we could start with your background, and then the, the journey from that into Bitcoin mining. Sure. Well, uh, I've been around for a while. I have a degree in uh, computer engineering, also have a degree in economics. Um, I got out of school in 1986, and it was uh, an interesting time because the, the world was just economically not in a good place. And I was, a, I was a good student. I had a degree that I thought would be very marketable, but it actually turned out the job market was really tough. Um, I ended up with two job offers coming out of school. Um, one was with the National Security Agency, uh, where I essentially would have been a spy for the National Security Agency. Oh, wow. Um, there's a whole long story probably for another day. Um, but I ended up going to work for a company called Zenith Data Systems, which was a division of Zenith Electronics. Uh, Zenith was one of the largest TV brands. Really, um, you know, until about 10 years ago, they were one of the predominant you know, TV brands in the world. Certainly in that time frame, they were huge. But they had a personal computer division. The personal computer was just getting started. And I, I was blessed with being thrust right into the guts of the personal computer industry, which was just in its infancy at that time, and was assigned to a project uh, as, a, as a test engineer. I did a little tiny, tiny bit of coding um, on what I would consider to be the world's first laptop computer, which was the Zenith Super Sport. If anybody wants to geek out and go look um, at history, what you'll see is that in 1987, Zenith had won a contract with the Department of Defense to provide laptop computers. And by the way, laptop, the way I'm defining it, the, the main attributes are what's called the clamshell design, meaning, you know, the 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 way that the the screen opens up and, and reveals sure. the keyboard. They didn't all used to be that way, by the way. That was kind of almost an innovative thing at that time. Um, and, it, you know, it, it ran. Microsoft DOS and it had a backlit screen and it had uh, initially it had floppy disk drives. You would you would take the floppy disks in and out as you would run a program. Um, used to do things like you'd run a program and it would it would program would be running along and it would say now insert disk four, you know, and then it would say insert <laughs> disk six, you know, and you'd have this big stack of floppies. And of course, the same sort of thing if you wanted to save a file. But anyway, I was really blessed um, to be in that industry, and and it gave me an opportunity, by the way, to rise very rapidly, because 
in essence, in the personal computer industry, even as a young guy, there really wasn't anybody that had significantly more experience than me. Um, you know, and and uh, just a, a side word of advice if somebody younger is out there. It's one of the great things about entering an industry that's in its infancy is that um, your lack of experience doesn't have the same negative effect as if you go into a an established industry. And certainly as I got gotten older, there are things that age and wisdom and experience, you know, kind of come together and they help. But you can overcome some of that if you're young and energetic and creative and like those sort of things. And I was blessed to be in that position. So um, I, I spent six years at Zenith, then left to do a startup company uh, with a couple other guys. And we we got about $15 million of funding from uh, Sanyo and Mitsui, two large Japanese corporations. This would have been in 91. Mm -hmm. And this was to design kind of a new phase of laptop computing. Um, we called it the sub notebook. So what we were designing uh, in that time period, we designed the first one kilogram, which would be 2.2 .2 pounds, uh, uh, laptop that ran windows so uh we ended up selling that design to gateway um which was in and of itself a a young company kind of up and coming at that time and through that relationship i got to know ted Waite, who was the founder and ceo um he asked me to come join his team uh which i did uh, and this was before gateway went public so it was a wonderful opportunity for me to be part of a team taking Gateway Public. And it also gave me the opportunity to essentially found the um, mobile computing area of Gateway, which um, I was able to grow to about a billion, actually over a billion dollar organization before um, ultimately I became the chief technology officer there. Uh, and then uh, ultimately the executive vice president of uh, international, meaning I ran all the overseas businesses for Gateway. Yeah. So I, I was in that industry from 86 to 2004. It was um, just a fantastic ride. And maybe we'll touch on this later. We can touch on it now, I guess, depending on where you want to go. But there are so many parallels to what's happening in Bitcoin today to what was happening in the personal computer industry um, in that in that same era. I actually that that's exactly where I wanted to to go. I I really appreciate the background because you have such such a unique insight into what I would imagine and where I imagine the the Bitcoin and Bitcoin mining space is rapidly heading towards. Um, maybe we'll just start broad stroke. What are some of the similarities you're seeing from your past experience at gateway to what you're seeing in in the bitcoin mining industry right now well i guess i'll start with that it was very tumultuous companies would rise up from nothing to become very significant only to collapse shortly thereafter Sounds familiar. And, you know, I think we, we see that certainly in Bitcoin. We, you know, we certainly saw it with all the, not necessarily Bitcoin, by the way. I think a lot of the Bitcoiners would say, well, the, the, the Celsius and Voyager and, you know, FTX debacles were, were a lot of crypto mentality infection. But honestly, you know, we've seen mining companies fail. We've seen... For instance, Core, which was the largest, you know, this time last year, yeah. Core was sitting on top of the world with a massive installation, seemingly a very strong balance sheet, sitting on a ton of Bitcoin. And here we are today and they're in bankruptcy. Well, they're still functioning, but they're in bankruptcy. And mm -hmm. um, I wish no ill upon them, but their their brand has been greatly diminished as a result of what happened. And that's what happened in the personal computer industry, that 
you know, we saw these companies, hardware companies, software companies, um, do the same sort of thing. That's one of the things that I learned was that growth, as exciting as it can be, can be a great enemy as well. And, you know, only growth that you can manage is worth it. I know that sounds kind of simplistic, but I'll give another example, which is Compass. I say Compass. So um, again, I wish no ill uh, to anybody, um, but I think if you look at, for instance, Compass and what happened with them, they had a great idea. Um, they started executing against that idea. They got phenomenal market response to their idea. And then they started having trouble executing. And instead of saying no, by, by no I mean as new customers and new business flowed in, instead of saying no, they kept saying yes. And they, they didn't know how to even swallow what they had already taken on. Yeah. And and yet they kept taking it, you know, it goes back to, you know, probably your mom or your grandma told you, you know, swallow your food, you know, don't, don't put too much in your mouth. <laughs> yep. well, there's a lot of wisdom from those sort of things. <clears throat> it's, it's hard. It's hard to say no. I, it's, it's really hard to say no. And it's also sometimes hard to be realistic about your expectations. And in technology, I think traditionally, I mean, I'm, I'm trying to think of just something generic. If you're in the um, cotton candy business, let's say, um, you probably don't have these issues, right? You decide to start a cotton candy company and you, you know, maybe, maybe you start gaining a following, but it's probably a slower organic growth and, you know, you can kind of take these this growth in chunks and and scale with it but it's very hard so so this massive amount of business coming in presents a problem the other thing that presents a problem is that it's personal growth there's a there's a great book back from my era um i think it was written in the 90s it's called crossing the chasm and it and it it kind of characterizes the problem of a company growing from a seed, you know, to an oak tree, basically, right? And yeah. uh, but but very rapidly. And so what'll what'll happen is when you start a company, let's say let's say Ben, you and I started a company today, um, and let's say you have some sales and marketing expertise, and I have some marketing and operation or, or some uh, technical and operations expertise. So we start this company, right? And we have a pretty clear division of labor. You do the sales and marketing stuff. I do the operations stuff. Mm -hmm. um, if you get an order, you call me up or maybe you yell from the other side of the room. Hey, Bob, I got an order for five more, whatever it is we're making. And I go figure out how to make five more, right? Yep. Well, <clears throat> Um, we start finding some success. So at some point we start hiring some people and, and now instead of two people, we have 10, let's say. Now maybe we're all still in a small office or we're, we're in some virtually connected thing, but um, we do have to change things a bit. Instead of yelling, hey, Bob, I have an order, maybe you actually enter an order into a system of some sort it could it could even be a, a spreadsheet or something something very simple yeah. but you know you let the organization know there's an order and let's say you know there's five people on your side of the business the sales and marketing doing their thing and there's five on my side doing our thing now um but it's a little more complicated and and uh but we're still at a point where probably between the two of us all the decisions are being made now we're really successful now let's say there's 100 people. And now we have an office in Florida, we have an office in Minnesota, and we have an office in uh, Belgium for some reason, right? Yep. Now the organizational complexity 
just went up logarithmically, right? So we've, we've, we've done this logarithmic function. Well, now the processes we use when we were two people and 10 people don't work. You know, we have to have formal systems. We have to have formal processes. We have to have, you know, meetings and, and ways of communicating. We have to make sure we don't ship an order twice. We have to make sure that we ship every order that comes in. We have to, you know, we have to handle all these things. You can't make all the decisions. I can't make all the decisions. We have to delegate. That, that tends to be a major break point for companies because often the skills the the like you and I maybe as the founders we're used to being we we make decisions we make them quickly we, they may yeah. not even be always be the right decision but we're always moving forward right well yeah now we have managers and maybe managers of managers and we have we have you know these processes that have to be be followed otherwise something gets left off um well the personality set that maybe made us successful at the beginning won't work at a hundred people. It won't work at a thousand people. And, and so companies fail. I guess that's what I'm saying because yeah. the, the people have to evolve. They either have to, you know, evolve their skill sets and their personalities. Very hard to do, by the way. It's very hard. That's why, you know, so many successful companies that seem like they're on the rise forever just fail, right? And 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 it's very rare to find people that, let's say, like if you and I had founded that company, our egos can start to get in the way too. So let's say, let's say now we have a hundred people and we're doing a hundred million dollars a year in business. Maybe we don't possess the proper skills to lead the company going forward. It's very hard for founders to step aside and let other people come in. So anyway, I'm getting a little long, long winded, but I think that's what's, what's happening in, in the Bitcoin industry right now is we we're going through this period of rapid growth and can the, the people in the companies evolve personally at a rate fast enough to keep up with the growth of their company. If they can't, do they have the ability to hire properly to bring in the people that do? Do they have the egos, the lack of ego maybe, to let mm -hmm. those people do what they need to do? Do they know how to manage risk? Um, those are big things because yeah. if we look back at core, as an example, you know, what did Core do wrong? Core took on an inordinate amount of risk betting on Bitcoin going up and mining continuing to be profitable. They may not have been wrong to have made that bet, but they didn't have a plan to mitigate the risk if that plan didn't work. That, that So I would say that was their biggest failure was not having plan B. What could they have done? I mean, they could have hedged the Bitcoin, right? They could have, for instance, shorted Bitcoin or shorted hash. There's a couple of derivative products in the hash world too. You could have, could have maybe shorted, yep. uh, shorted yep. something. So, so um, you know, that's the failure. Um, and, you know, we'll, we'll get maybe into some of my philosophies about mining later, but you know, I believe those those are the types of things Bitcoin as a as a whole has to work on, too, is that we're going to be threatened. We're going to we're going to hit bumps in the road. Some of them will be self-imposed. Some of them will come from outside forces. And we have to create the entire ecosystem in such a manner that we are resistant to these threats yeah and as an engineer when you look at a situation it could be a product you develop a network you develop uh, you know whatever you have to look at 
the reliability of what you're designing. And I, if, if I said to the average person, hey, I've designed X, whatever X is, with 99% reliability. Oh, that's pretty good, right? And well, if, if you're only making one of that thing and you don't expect it to run for a long period of time and it's non-mission critical, that's probably okay. That's probably fine for a design parameter. If, however, and I'll give an example from my world, if what you're designing is a battery uh, char and charging battery pack and charging system for a laptop computer, that you expect to sell millions of that computer, you expect them to be in continuous use for five years. Mm -hmm. 99% reliability is crap because um, if it fails, um, then catastrophic things happen, <laughs> can happen on a failure. And over the course of five years, you're going to have a massive percentage of those units fail. Let, let's, let's even say it's a, um, that 99%, let's say, was a one-year number. So over the course of five years, 5% 5 of several million, let's even say 1 million, means 50,000 laptops have a failure. And if 10% of those failures result in a fire, that's 5,000 fires. Well, yeah. that's not very good. Right? So, <laughs> so when I look at Bitcoin, when I look at my own mining operation, when I look at the ecosystem itself, especially the mining component mm -hmm. of the network, I think about it in terms of a thousand years. I think we, we need to design the network with extremely high level of reliability for a thousand years. Because if we don't, if we design it for high reliability for one year or 10 years or 20 years, which I think, by the way, is the context a lot of people think in, it's not good enough. There are so many failure, potential failure points, most completely out of control of the Bitcoin world, um, that um, given a thousand year run, all these things will happen. Um, I, I live in South Florida, you know, Hurricane Ian happened, okay, massive yeah. catastrophic environmental thing. Um, we had like the size of the earthquakes that we've seen recently in Turkey. So imagine a massive amount of the mining infrastructure centered in one place um, and, and, you know, what could happen. And, you know, so in other words, the attack could be legislative, it could be from... Um, environmental issues. It could come because of uh, eco-terrorism. There are a variety of attack vectors. We'll be right back after this message from our sponsor. Support for this episode comes from Sunnyside Digital. Are you ready for the next Bitcoin bull run? Get ahead of the game by building out your Bitcoin mining infrastructure now. Sunnyside Digital is your one-stop shop for everything Bitcoin mining, from transformers and switchgear to racks and miners. With a white glove approach to understanding your needs, They'll provide you with the hardware you need at the most competitive pricing possible. Say goodbye to your sourcing headaches and say hello to Sunnyside Digital. Contact their sales team today at sunnysideinc.ca or via email at bwalsh at sunnysideinc.ca. All right, now back to the show. Yeah. So. And so I, we, we will get into that, Bob, because I'm, I'm very fascinated in, in that that has a lot to do with with your company's strategy in in your deployments. Just maybe to to circle all the way back to the the similarity between the the personal computer industry and the actual physical hardware. So the the Bitcoin mining ASICs that we see today. I wanted to just quick ask your thoughts on: Do you think we're going to see a commoditization of ASICs similar to what? And again, I, I wasn't, I, I don't have as much insight into the personal laptop space, but I would imagine it went through a pretty dramatic commoditization period where it, it was relatively expensive. And now I can go buy a very nice laptop for 600 bucks. 
Um, do you think we'll see that with with ASICs? Yeah. Um, actually, let me start. I have, a, I have a little soapbox issue. Please don't take this personal, personally. <laughs> no, not at all. Um, it's actually the term ASIC to begin with. Okay, so. And, uh, and, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, I, I, yeah. I'm sure I, I think I know where you're going with it. Yeah, so, so and it's just, it's it's the engineer in me. I'm, um, some people will think I'm being very uh, anal about something, but, but, but I do it for a reason. So an ASIC is an application-specific integrated circuit. They've been around forever. Um, Bitcoin people may not understand that the world had lots of ASIC applications well before um, before this. We used to use yep. them, for instance, in laptop control circuitry. We would design ASICs to control um, uh, charging circuitry in, in our laptop computers. So an ASIC is a chip. And um, I try to use the word as often as possible, either mining server or mining equipment, mining machine. Um, and, and the reason is that if you think about, for instance, a personal computer, which, which you know we're trying to make a relationship here a little bit, you might go buy a Dell laptop with an Intel CPU of a certain model, right? Yep. Um, but you also might buy a Dell laptop with an AMD CPU of a certain model. Um, back in the old days, by the way, um, th there are, there were there were significantly more choices in CPU. So we used to design with Intel CPUs. There's a company called Harris that had a version of the 8286, which is kind of the I don't know, the, the godfather of the the current personal computer infrastructure. Of course, AMD was involved. There's a company called Chips and Technology. So. The point being, you would buy a personal computer or a laptop computer, and it would have a certain type of personal uh, of of CPU, central processing unit. So, I I think using the word ASIC is fine, but I think it's important that we we get to the point of saying, "Hey, I'm I'm buying a mining machine, a mining server. I prefer server, by the way, but yeah." Yeah, uh, and by the way, there's there's some important reasons for it. I'll, I'll, I'll legislatively interest be, beyond being specific and making sure that we're communicating properly. There's also some legislative reasons. But if you um, if you if you think forward five or ten years, like you, the basic question was commoditization. Here's what I think will yeah. happen. I believe you will have several different companies from the chip world who specialize in making chips. Intel. And so if I want to design my own mining equipment, the Bob brand of, 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 of those, I'm not a chip maker. Um, I'm a system designer. So I believe what we'll see in the future is you will go buy a mining server with a brand X, model of ASIC inside it, okay? And that ASIC will have certain attributes. And so I think it's important for us to, to, to use that. By the way, I think it's also, uh, it, it may not always be a mining server. It, it, it's, in my mind, highly likely that there will be other multi-purpose devices that contain those ASICs as well. Um, you know, we see people already, um, you know, hobbyists, I guess I would call them, who have made pool heaters. And so what they've done is they've they've repurposed their, um, I don't know, an S9 or an S19 or whatever, yeah. and they, they create these things that are pool heaters or connected to their their um, HVAC system or, you know, whatever. I, I personally think that we'll see a lot more of that. And so the device may be a hot water heater with, this thing, a pool heater with this thing or whatever. And, and you'll be referring to the ASIC that's in there as the mining component. Um, so I really appreciate that distinction, actually. And I think just another point to highlight that is when Intel made their announcement about making ASICs, I think everyone expected 
to to see you know like what I have behind me the the full server come yes. out from Intel. You dig a little deeper, and then you start to find out what what that actually meant. And I think it's going in the direction that. So I, I appreciate that clarification, and and the insight on this is is good too. Yeah, and it's you know it's one of those things I would call it a bad habit that is pervasive through the industry. It's going to be very hard to break it. Um, I don't know of anybody else that is uh, other than me that really cares about it right now. But I think that, you know, hopefully it will, you know, it will work itself out. But, but I am afraid that, you know, you just create this. The other thing is you create confusion for people entering the Bitcoin world. You know, so it it's like, you know, if, if you're, especially anybody with some technical competency comes into the Bitcoin area and they start hearing people talk about ASICs, well, they're, they're expecting you to be talking about a chip. And 99.9% and right. <laughs> right. of the time people are talking about this, you know, um, system. I, so, I found that out in my... In my corporate experience, the 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 company I'm with has an incubator program, and and when you say ASIC, it means exactly what you're saying. And there was a lot of confusion around the actual what is the ASIC. Yeah, so I, right. I, for me, I I get yeah. it. So I appreciate that. So 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 beyond this reason, though, so there there may be somebody out there listening and they say well that's a load of crap bob uh, and i respect anybody that says this but let me give one other reason why this is important beyond just the technical um accuracy of uh, and description if we look at attack vectors to the bitcoin system we'll look at people like elizabeth warren okay now there are there are people like Elizabeth Warren who look at our industry and they're going to do everything in their power to try to stop it. It's very clear, right? They hate us. They hate everything we do, everything we stand for. Um <clears throat> and they're trying to find as many ways as possible to define what we do. and carve it out and mm -hmm. make legislation that carves it out. I believe what the Bitcoin community as a whole should be saying and going back to my nomenclature is, hey, we have servers that run software and fundamentally there's no difference between what we do and what Google or Amazon or Microsoft do in, in, with their warehouses and their, their systems. And I believe it's very important from a personal liberty standpoint that we not succumb to this nomenclature that, that Pigeon holds us a certain way and we kind of self-define ourselves into a corner yep. because I think what we should say is, hey, the government, based on the, at least the First Amendment, if not some other amendments too, has no right to tell us whether or not we can run a computer and they have no right to tell us what software we can run on that computer. Because that's if, if the, the word of caution for any, I doubt anybody that uh, hates Bitcoin is listening, but if you happen to be listening, the reason that you should also be supporting what I'm saying is that this is opening Pandora's box. If we allow the government to make decisions and preclude us from plugging whatever we think is appropriate into the outlet in the wall and preclude us from deciding what software is appropriate to run on our computers. We have given them access that you'll never get back. 
and it should scare the shit out of you yeah because it essentially allows now regulatory bodies or or even laws themselves to say hey you can run excel but you can't run powerpoint you can you can plug in this kind of computer but not this kind or you can only you can, run microsoft applications and not any yeah. other yeah. yeah or maybe only applications that are nsa certified or yeah. that have passed a certain test um you know it also is making judgments moral and ethical judgments about the use of energy that you know um do you need a microwave oven no well then you shouldn't use energy on it it's more efficient <laughs> to use this you know we're seeing this with like the natural gas stove versus the electric stove right now though they're taking a safety angle at it but you know i i i mean to me it's a very obvious thing that they're attacking fossil fuel consumption um and and you know i don't want to paint a dystopian view of the future but there's a non-zero possibility of a very dystopian future <laughs> if if we succumb to relinquish and relinquish some of our personal freedoms and you know like like they say in a lot of things but you know um today again if you're a bitcoin hater and you're listening you may hate bitcoin and everything it stands for but um if 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 you allow the government to take action to try to restrict it you've you've just given them carte blanche to decide the thing that maybe you like next or you believe in next is is next on the radar yeah i i job for me personally fully agree with all of that i i think a lot of the people and i think the majority of this audience will will be in agree you know agreement with with all of that um it's definitely something to be careful of and i i personally and and I know I said ASIC in the question, but I, I mean, I personally usually refer to them, especially when you're talking to power companies or anyone who is on the outside of the Bitcoin mining industry. I do. I usually call them computers because that 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 just sits a little bit better with with most people. But um, for for a lot of the reasons you just outlined, I, I do take that approach as well. Hopefully the the industry catches on. <laughs> Hopefully. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I, I want to go into the mining strategy of barefoot, but I, I did want to go back one more time. So with, to the commoditization of, of it, the, the computers themselves, the Bitcoin mining computers and servers, do you think that it just takes one big player to step in who has the scale to produce the ASICs for these Bitcoin mining servers? Do you think that's what, breaks that coral because right now we see this really heavy correlation bitcoin price goes up the the computers go up in price there seems to be a very controlled supply of the computers at the moment do you think all it takes is intel to to bust into the scene in a big way to to make things cheaper or, or more commoditized it probably takes a couple frankly um and it doesn't, but it doesn't take a lot. One thing to note, again, you know, we live in the Bitcoin world. We're so small. And by the way, we're probably never going to be that big. Just to put it in context, because we've been talking a lot of PC analogies. Um, annually right now, there are about 300 to 350 million personal computers produced annually. Okay, wow. so on a global basis. And that's been going on for uh, for the last 15 years, it's been on that scale. But even if you go back, let's see, it would be, I, forgive me if I'm wrong slightly, but let's say 1984, 1985, just as I'm coming out, the IBM personal computer, the first one had just been introduced. They were already selling a couple million a year. So um, 
Bitmain and MicroBT combined, the pub, public figures are not released, but we can somewhat back into it because we know, mm -hmm. let's say on a rough basis, there's a, uh, 250 to 300 exahashes per second. The the network is somewhere in that range. Yep. If we said, um, even if we said 100% of that hash rate is machines built within the last two years, average global hash, uh, uh, average hash rate per machine of let's say 100 terahashes per second, might be slightly low, but again, we're just getting order of magnitude. That means that maybe there's about a hundred, 1.5 million mining machines made per year. So, you know, the personal computer market is 600 times bigger yeah. than the Bitcoin market. That's just the personal computer. Now, look at phones, which is bigger than the personal computer market um, and all that. So, and by the way, it's hard, it's hard to imagine the Bitcoin mining market materially gaining ground, at least in the next decade, on those figures. Um, but probably never because there, there's, um, the only exception would be if we, if we find, you know, the ASIC, again, we're talking about the mm -hmm. ASIC, at small scales, at small levels, end up being integrated into like every device, okay, which sure. I believe to, for me is utopia. That would be fantastic. Yeah. Um, and it's the strongest thing for the network is for the hash to be diverse, diverse in that manner. But so the, the reason I'm taking through this math and the sizing is that we're, we, we as a community, whether it's just two, two suppliers, or, or eight suppliers of the ASICs, we're dividing up a pretty small pie. We want access to the best fabs in the world, you know, the, the, the lowest power consumption, highest performance uh, wafers in the, in the yep. world. Um, we're never gonna get it in, in any large, capacity like it just it's just not going to happen we just don't have the horsepower um so so i i believe that there will be a commoditization i believe that we'll see several companies build the asics i think we'll see the disassociation of the asic from the machine that um i think the reason that this nomenclature going back to that happened is that Right now, that's the way it is. It's MicroBT and yeah. Bitmain. The makers uh, of the A6 are also the makers of the systems, and we've gotten sure. used to that. And and if if that wasn't the case, if there was an Intel-like company involved from the very beginning, and and MicroBT and and um, Bitmain were making these as system makers, then we would already ha we would already be past this but sure. the the commoditization yes i think it will continue to happen i think it's important by the way like what you see if you're a gamer there's, there's probably people out there listening you know that are gamers well mm -hmm. one of the things that that you probably would appreciate are the standards of the personal computer um you can you can go buy if you want to assemble your own you you have your choice of chassis, power supplies, um, backplanes that all have, let's say, a, a PCI-based interface uh, or, or um, uh, slots. Um, you have all these things, well, and they're industry standard, and so you can you can Plug assemble them. Yeah. I yeah. I believe that that is an important movement forward for this industry as well. And by the way, that was a big part of the personal computer industry was things that the public would not have seen was um, I served on several committees, you know, um, like how did, as an example, um, USB and Bluetooth were, were largely the result of personal computer companies working cooperatively together to define a specific standard both 
you know, electrically, mechanically, um, and, you know, some of the software interface components. Um, and, you know, I served on some of those committees that, that, that helped make that stuff happen. So because we all were united in the fact that we could all reduce our cost structures, we could increase the serviceability. Um, it was the only way for us to realistically push performance higher, because if you look at USB as an example, we as the personal computer makers, had to provide a consistent standard across the 300 million computers that we were building collectively so that the companies who were designing things like webcams and mice knew that they could they could just design one that would plug into yeah. all of them so um i think we're going to see that sort of stuff happen in um, the mining area in the mining server area and and it will, it will allow more companies to enter and, and create systems. It'll, it'll probably allow the hobbyist to build his own if he wants. Probably never be the most cost efficient, but a lot of people just like building their own stuff. And I, I, yeah. I applaud that. Yeah, I appreciate that. And, and thank you for, for entertaining my, my interest in a lot of that overlap between the, the laptop industry, the, the personal computer industry and the, the Bitcoin mining server industry. I, I personally am very curious to watch that space and to see how that evolves. So I'd love to, to move into your company, Barefoot Mining. Um, okay. You guys are, are known for your wild horse sites and really looking for those unique pockets of power. I'd love to hear maybe if you could just touch on what those conversations look like um, when you're talking to the companies and the, the people that have those pockets. And then maybe actually to, to back up in my own question, sorry, if you could maybe touch on what is a wild horse site from your perspective, and then how are you having those conversations with, with people and companies? If we look at the landscape of mining, um, in my own nomenclature, um, there's an article in Bitcoin Magazine, anybody that wants to dig deeper, but I'll, I'll try to give a quick overview. I, I divide mining itself into three kind of site types, um, rabbits, elephants, and horses. Elephants are probably obvious. They're the big sites that you read about all the time. Um, Marathon putting up a 200 megawatt facility here, Windstone trying to scale to a gigawatt facility over here. Um, and elef so elephant sites, I call them elephants because they're big and powerful, which is obvious, but they're, they're, also, uh, they're also slow to grow. It takes a long time to put one up. Um, they're also easy to hunt because they're easy to find, right? And, and they're not very mobile, right? So if something happens, you can't just pick it up and move it. But that's, that's an elephant, elephant site, pros and cons of everything. Rabbits are the individuals or really micro, micro sites. A guy that's got one in his basement, three in his shed, maybe a small business owner who throws a couple into his server closet, um, you know, th those are the rabbits and they're small, but they're fast, right? You can put one up, you know, I, you know, you could theoretically put one up yeah. today and get it working. Um, and if something happens and you need to move it, you can go over there really quickly. So they're very mobile and they're everywhere. They're hard to hunt. It's hard to shoot one. It's impossible to shoot them all. Like to shoot yeah. them to extinction is virtually impossible. So that's why I use that nomenclature. The horses are kind of the small scale commercial sites. And they, um, they're powerful, but they're not, they're not like an elephant to create. You know, maybe it's a couple hundred um, kilowatts. Maybe it's a couple megawatts. It's in that kind of category size. 
dozens of servers, maybe hundreds of servers, maybe a thousand, but probably not much more than that. Um, they're still powerful. You can put them up quickly. You could probably hunt them individually, but you know, still kind of hard, hard to uh, hard to hunt them. And by the way, if they even sniff that you're that you're out hunting for them, they can move. Like they can, you know, unlike the elephants who are kind of stuck there, right? If an elephant finds out you're going to hunt for them. Um, and, and by the way, hunt, hunting means um, legislatively the area where you're mining, they're going to ban mining, they're going to tax it. Yep. It could also be eco-terrorism, um, which I believe we're going to see more and more and more of. I don't know what's happening in the world today, but there's some weird stuff going on. And, you know, I, I, I wonder. Um, but, but I believe there will be acts of physical violence uh, Jason Lowry, power projection, physical power projection, kinetic power projection against mining sites will happen. They're not going to do it against the rabbits. Even if they do, it won't damage it. It's unlikely they'll do it against the horses. Same thing. They might get a couple, but they're nothing that can really damage it. So those are the three sizes. And my company focused on being horse size sites. Now, the second part of it is, is wild versus captive. So I could have called it on-grid and off-grid, and it would be close to correct. So, um, but I use the terms captive and wild. So captive means that you, as a miner, are beholden to somebody else to provide you the power. And so your entire operation is dependent on the cooperation of that party. Um, wild means that you're not dependent on somebody else, that you, you certainly are off-grid, but you, know, you, you, you have a mechanism by which you've reduced your exposure of not being able to get the power you've 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 set it down by you know an order of magnitude mm -hmm. so a wild horse is a small commercial site that is running on an independent non-grid connected power source typically would be controlled by the miner or a partnership with the miner something on that order i yeah I, and I appreciate that. Thank you. Um, so when looking at that, the, the wild horse site, which is what you guys specialize in, how are you guys finding those, those areas to, to locate in? Well, it's, um, and in one respect, it's easy. In one respect, it's hard. And, and so around the world, um, I think a lot of people understand this if you're in the Bitcoin world. There's a lot of energy out there. Um, solar farms and hydro dams and flared gas and, you know, there's all kinds of exotic stuff that's possible. Anaerobic digestion and volcano mining and, you know, um, all, all those things, by the way, are happening at some scale somewhere. Uh, people burning tires. Um, I mean, there's there's all that sort of stuff is happening. Um, finding those sites requires a lot of persistence because there's not a there's not like a website that you go to and you say you know let me search for um, anaerobic digestion. Uh, you know, <laughs> power operations. Yep. Um, you know, so you have to really get yourself out there. Part of the reason I come on shows like yours, um, we, we, for instance, have advertised for the last year in Bitcoin Magazine, the actual hard copy of Bitcoin Magazine. We bought the inside front cover of it. Mm -hmm. And part of it is to, to let people in the energy industry, um, or I should say, well, anybody that has access to energy, 
to know that we're there and we're interested in those kind of deals. Now, you know, we'd love it if, if, if you, for instance, uh, have a stranded gas well that um, you've already drilled, you know the gas is there and what you just need is a generator and, a, and some miners there. We, you know, we'd love to talk to companies like that. Um, but, you know, we've done things like, you know, went out and, you know, bought a hydroelectric facility so we could do this. Um, but I, you know, this, I guess that's, that's what makes it hard. I guess, you know, Ben is, um, you know, I, um, I wrote another article for Bitcoin magazine. It's called the miners trilemma. And the miners trilemma is that when you, if you, if you want to get in the mining or in the mining business, what you'll find is that bringing up a new site requires three main things. It requires access to the mining servers requires access to energy uh and it requires access to money and the miners trilemma that i've created or 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 proposed is that at any point in time one of those is always hard by definition one is always hard so um a great example of that is if we were in the fall of 2021, mining equipment was impossible to find. Energy was moderately hard. I wouldn't call it hard, hard, but you know, it, it, it was there. And money was so easy. There was, you know, access to capital was just flush. Um, by the way, that was the trap of core scientific was, hey, we can get the cash and buying the miners is hard. So the mining equipment is hard. So we're going to use the fact that we've solved the hardest part of the equation to go. Well, yeah, the the easy part of the equation is capital. So we're going to go use our just grossly dominant position in that area to go solve the hard part of the problem. You know, they they did, but you know, again, they got caught with their pants down because they hadn't they hadn't thought through the second order effect of of, mm-hmm. of this, nor had they they come up with their um, their backup plan. But so, if we look at the miners' trilemma, well, if we're at a point right now where that flipped, by the way, so now we sit in a world where the mining equipment is very easy to get you can get um pretty much anything you want right now at really attractive prices in any quantity that you want um i'm very happy with our access to that energy um energy is kind of right now it's kind of always moderately hard especially if we're talking about this kind of energy wild energy because We're, we're constantly looking at it, uh, looking for it. Um, and what turns out to happen in a lot of cases is even when we find, let's say somebody in Western Pennsylvania has a stranded gas well. Well, there's mineral rights and surface rights. Um, there, are, there are all kinds of funky business deals that have to come together um there are people from the energy side of the world who often don't understand our situation and they'll say like i'll give an example like hey um a stranded gas well okay well they'll look at the current price of gas and say hey it's a certain amount per mcf um and i'll say yeah i'm willing to buy it for you at this certain mcf Mm -hmm. but price per mcf but they'll say well what if what if the price of gas goes way up so well i still want to pay you the current price because what 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 am i looking for i'm looking for predictability i'm looking for a fixed cost that i can count on because I already have enough variables. I have, I have, I'm already playing a game with global hash rate and Bitcoin price. So I don't need to also be playing with, 
uh, a variable on the cost input side. So, but what will I what will I offer? Well, if the price of gas crashes and I'm paying more, I'm willing to pay more. I'm willing to disassociate my cost of gas acquisition from the market price. This is what I'm saying. That's and so if they if if the energy provider wants some certainty in their life then they can get it from bitcoin you know or if if they want to play a little bit you know we can come up with deals where okay you know my prosperity is their prosperity and my my um my detriment is their detriment if they want to play that game but when it comes to push and shove most of them don't want to do that most of them want to just you know, but anyway, the, the the reason I'm going through this is I'm trying to articulate that putting these deals together is very hard. So yeah, um, finding the energy is moderately hard. Finding these partners is moderately hard, but putting the deal together is really hard. And and yeah, uh, in the the <clears throat> the flat rate is is an interesting proposal. Are you finding a lot of interest? And I know that that's just pertaining to to flare gas or or natural gas, but it, is the initial conversation exciting and and interested that the parties are interested, or does it take a little bit of explaining to kind of loosen them up to to the whole idea? Every every single situation is unique. Um, at this point, I think we're seeing that. A lot of the people in the, especially the oil and gas space, at least have some knowledge that Bitcoin exists and that we are, you know, we're a way of utilizing stranded or stranded gas or, or gas that's less efficient to um, monetize for them. Yep. Um, you know, but and but there are also a lot of people chasing, in, in our world, in our Bitcoin world, there's a lot of guys chasing these sort of things. And uh, most of the deals are, are still out there with small private, privately held oil and gas operations or landowners, you know, the, now it, it, there may be some big ones, but again, I'm not chasing those. So I, you know, I, I don't, I can't really tell you. I haven't sat in the, you know, Exxon boardroom and and had a talk because that's not even my interest. Um, if somebody from Exxon's listening and they do want to talk, I would probably talk to you. <laughs> but yeah, but my guess is we probably wouldn't be compatible um, unless what you wanted to do was create a bunch of small sites. Because I, I, one of the things I've said is. I've said, it, given the choice between I can do a, a one 100 megawatt site or 52 megawatt sites, I will do 52 megawatt sites. And I'm probably atypical. History may prove me to be an idiot. I don't know. Um, but I'm pretty strong in my conviction that that's the best path for at least my company. But I also think it's the best path for the ecosystem because go back to the wild horses thing you know that that if we are attacked at the nation state level um and by the one of the examples i'll give is uh, i give texas as an example nothing against texas i would be i don't have any operations there but i, I i'm not saying i wouldn't do it mm -hmm. but a lot of the texas folks are just so adamant about texas being the um the mecca of mining and that, you know, it's this panacea that can solve all these problems. And it's a, it's a damn good place. Um, so again, I'm, I'm not trying to say it, but I think what, what people haven't considered is what if six years from now, not this next presidential election, but the one after, what if uh, AOC is the president? What if Elizabeth Warren becomes the Secretary of Energy? Um, you know, what if Bernie Sanders has some role in this whole thing? Like, what if Beta O'Rourke becomes governor of Texas instead of Jim? Like, 
And um, I'm not predicting those things. But again, I'm, I'm, I'm looking at it from a, a probabilistic perspective and say, is the chance of that greater than zero? The answer is yes. I, yeah. I don't care who you are. The answer is yes. Those are possible circumstances whether that's at six years or 10 years or whatever. But if you're putting up a one gigawatt facility, you damn well better have a 20 year, 30 year plan for that thing. And, and so um, if I had to make that bet, would Texas be the place I bet in? It'd probably be one of a handful of places I would make that bet, but I just, I wouldn't make that bet. I would make a bunch of small bets scattered, scattered across because now my company is better insulated so that if something happens because legislatively man mining is banned in Texas or there's an environmental catastrophe and mining is impossible in Texas for an extended period of time, or if it becomes the target of eco-terrorism because it's the center, it's the honeypot, right? I mean, again, all those are non-zero possibility things. So it gets back to creating diversity across the mining network it's fine for there to be some elephants. Uh, so, and I respect the right of any company that wants to be an elephant to be an elephant, but yep. we don't want a world with all elephants and no horses and rabbits. And, and uh, ultimately if that's the case, um, then uh, the elephants are all going to go down too um, because the, the vulnerability is just too great. My opinion. Yeah, absolutely. I, you know, as we're talking through some of these different examples of these sites, one thing that, that comes to mind is pockets of stranded wind. And, and maybe just to, to clarify that is, you know, some private group built a bunch of wind turbines in an area that may not have the demand for that much electricity being generated. And so it's yeah. typically called congestion on the transmission lines that there's yeah. just not enough demand for that power. And so, Yep. They end up getting turned off. There's actually quite a bit of that in the Midwest, in yep. in Iowa and the Dakotas, and um, some down in the the southern parts of Minnesota. And I would imagine that these groups would be extremely enthusiastic to have a, a barefoot mining approach them and say, "We can solve this problem. We can help you stay on. We can help you monetize your assets." and and have a very mutual partnership there with all of that i so i see a clear path to that do you hear any objections from these groups yeah the groups themselves um I, i've been involved in some dialogue with them um, and to be clear we haven't done anything there um, we have done uh, we just did some work uh in florida uh with a um, greenhouse operation that has some solar and so we, we, we have done an installation in, in that case. Um, again, you know, it's, it's uh, uh, very small scale, by the way, I think about 50 servers. But, but like if we use this wind example, the, the big problem, the big problem has this been that when, when, we, when we get into those discussions, we're the tension occurs is if we make the capital investment containers, mining servers, we want them to run 24 by seven. So mm -hmm. can we be a great friend to them in points of excess production? Absolutely. You know, we can, we can monetize that, but we, for that to work. And this is the problem with a lot of the green stuff that's intermittent is that we need to run 24 by seven. So we need some sort of friendly way of pulling back from the grid in cases when the wind's not blowing. And that's often where the problem occurs is that, well, you know, how, it's same with solar, right? I mean, cause sure. solar, it's a, it's a for sure thing, right? You know, you have, let's say you pick the right Downtown. spot, even here in yeah. Florida you know you got eight or nine hours of sunlight per day. Well, what does that mean? That means two thirds of the time you have to have an alternative source. 
or you have to scale down the size of the facility to approximately one third of what you would expect, put the extra capital into the batteries so, so that you can run the two thirds of the time when the sun's not shining, you pull off of the batteries and the rest of the time. So when you start going through those economics, it gets hard. And so, you know, I think the attractiveness of the gas stuff and some of the other technologies is that it, um, you generally can arrange something where you have a really high uptime of the energy source. So hy hydro can do that. Um, mm -hmm. Although even even hy like hydro, because we own a hydro facility, one of the things is picking the right size of the facility. So like we happen to be on a river in South Carolina and the river flow varies fairly strong, let's say between uh, July, which is a very low month, and like February and March, which are very high months, they're very wet. So we can run more miners this time of year. So then we have this economics of like, hey, do we have, do we have, it's a little better than wind in that, that we, you know, do we bring units in there that maybe run most, if not all the time for seven or eight months, but then scale down and move, remove some or turn them off in the down months. That's mm. a, that's a much better problem than dealing with it every day or on a continual basis. Um, so anyway, I, I, I'll, I'll, I should probably let you ask questions. Uh, no, no, I, I, I appreciate that insight. And I think what's, what's interesting about it and, and hearing, you know, barefoot mining strategy is I think you hear a lot of conversation around renewables and, you know, the green energy sector as Bitcoin mining being a really good bolt on or add on to the business to help them monetize. And, and it sounds like what you're saying is yes. However, that variability in the energy generation causes a real headache when you start to really dive into the economics of the, the Bitcoin mining business. Um, right. I think it's a really important thing for people to hear and, and to understand. Yeah. And the end result is like we have, um, yeah, I, we, our main base of operations is in South Dakota. We do have, um, on grid operations. So while my passion is toward wild horse mining, we do have on grid operations and those on grid operations, um, where we're buying directly from the utility company are primarily fueled by wind and hydro. And so we, we still provide, I, I, I think they like us, um, the utility company, because we do provide a, a, a fairly decent base load. That's mm -hmm. 24 by seven. Um, in that area of the country, we don't have the sophistication that is often implemented like in the grid and ERCOT that you hear people talk about a lot with, you know, well, we're, we're on, we're off, you know, whatever. It's yeah. more, um, we just run 24 by seven and you know, we've, we've let the electric company know like, Hey, if, if you ever have an emergency situation, give us a call and we'll turn off. Cause you know, we, we want hospitals and nursing homes to have power if they can't, but we're not, we don't, we don't build in that sophistication and there's not an economic incentive for us to build it in. That's it's right. just, you know, being decent human beings, um, that we would react in that situation. So, um, you know, will that come? It, it might, it might, but again, there has to be economic incentive and, you know, to, to the credit of the Texas folks. I mean, I think that there are some advantages of the way that that system works. Um, there's also disadvantages to the way that system works, but, but, you know, that's one of the things is they've, they've created economic incentive for miners to work cooperatively, um, in that method. But, but in, in other words, I guess what I'm coming back to is that in reality, I think when you deal with a lot of the green stuff, it honestly kind of forces you into a the, the wind 
and solar. It kind of forces you into a captive relationship in a, in a large percentage of the cases with a utility company. Either you buy everything from that source or you have to have them as the backup. Yeah. That, you know, one of those two situations comes in and um, hence, um, I th yeah, I, I don't know how pervasive like mining next to solar will be as an example because because of that so if sure you know unless the buyback is really cheap yeah um you you bring up another really good point and and this would definitely be a whole nother conversation a whole separate subject is the difference in so when you look at the different grids especially ERCOT versus MISO and and you start to look at the the incentives that are you know there for the Bitcoin mining industry, the curtailment strategy in the Midwest on, on the MISO grid is so different. It, you know, you've got time of day rate structures or like you were saying, you're curtailing just because you want the nursing home to have power. <laughs> so it's yeah. very, very different strategies. You see it typically blended into the, the rate. And it's kind of like what you were saying, where it's this this flat, steady rate that you know what you're going to get. There's no fluctuations. There's no buying future contracts to to hedge your your risk of your yeah. rates. And very interesting. Um, yep. What? So I, I guess kind of a, a not so much closing question, but you know, as we're kind of winding the conversation down, it's it's crazy how fast an hour can go by when when talking about Bitcoin mining. Um, what would you say, or from your perspective, what is something that these, you know, whether it's flare gas or, or stranded gas or some of these, these sites that you're locating, what might they be missing or, or what would you like, if they didn't understand the business, what might they be missing? I think a lot of the pe people that are reluctant, um, just flat out don't have confidence in Bitcoin. So, um, and by the way, I'm, uh, number one thing they don't get is this world of, hey, let's lock into a long-term deal at a fixed rate. I mean, they, they live in this variable world and they, they, um, they'll say, well, I'll, especially stranded, Flair's a little different, but let's just talk stranded for a minute. So stranded guy would say, well, um, you know, you should pay me market rate or maybe a slight discount to market rate um, when you're using it or whoever is using it. And then um, if the price, if the market price bombs, I just won't sell it and I'll wait till I can sell it. Right. And, and, and um, in my mind, if I were them, I would say, well, Hey, I have this asset. I can, I can pull out, a very predictable amount of dollars from this asset. Um, and the consumer it, it is gonna, the consumer, which would be the miner, is, is gonna be just pulling it out like super consistently. So mm -hmm. I, I think that they, they get caught up in the math of the booms in the bus and they, you know, they, they, they just, they also even forget inflation. Like when they look at it, like, Oh, I, I wait in the future, I can wait four years. And then maybe instead of paying you $3 per MCF, I'll be getting four fifty. and go, well, what's the time value of the money that while you, while you were waiting and mm -hmm. is the purchasing power of that really better? Um, like those sorts of things. Um, the other thing is, I think they, some of them, many of them still think of us as the general public does, which as borderline criminals and shysters and that we're all SBF and, yeah. you know, are they going to get paid? And like, you'll, like, you'll see things 
in a contract that that or a proposal about like amount of prepaid gas that you have to buy or the amount that you have to have in escrow or like some of those sort of things that frankly I think are obnoxious and scare some of us away because it, it you know that that's when when the rubber hits the road and you're trying to put a deal together like those are the types of things that really kind of will irk you well okay you know prepay me for six months of gas prepay me for um your surface rights for two years like th th yeah. there are things like that that float into these negotiations that just become unbearable yeah yeah well i i appreciate the insight there i i like asking that question towards the the close because i think it helps for for the audience that is on the the power generation side of this to help kind of give a window into the Bitcoin mining industry and and some of the things that, you know, maybe we can continue to work towards bridging the gap between both industries and maybe remove some of that friction. Um, so it's good to get the perspective from the Bitcoin mining side to hear where some of that friction is and, and where, you know, we can start to alleviate it. Um, so, Bob, I think what I'd love to have you do is give kind of a handoff for the audience, where can people get in touch with you, Barefoot Mining? Um, feel free to, to to give all that up. Okay, thank you, Ben. Um, so you can you can find us at barefootmining.com. It's fairly simple. Uh, I'm on Twitter, uh, fairly active, uh, uh, boomer uh, underscore BTC on Twitter. Um, we have a show of our own called Mind Your Business that's available on YouTube, Spotify, those sorts of things. We do kind of long form podcasts, uh, shows uh, with, you know, members of the Bitcoin community. Um, uh, um, what else? Um, uh, I'm, I'm on uh, Noster now. Um, I, I can't give you my public key, though. <laughs> so, but, but if you if you go to Twitter, you can you can find my Noster if you're if you're so inclined. Um, I'm still getting used to it. I've, I've only been on about a week, but you know I am I'm making sure I have a backup plan in case something happens with Twitter. Um, and we've seen a lot of the Bitcoin community, by the way, is is very active on Noster. So. Still working on figuring that one out. Yep. Yeah. So yeah. Well, great, Bob. I, I really appreciate the time. Um, this conversation was fantastic and super insightful for for both the Bitcoin miners listening and the the power producers and generators. Um, appreciate your time and thanks for thanks for chatting today. Thank you, Ben. Thank you.